Good morning. Welcome to Bethel United Methodist Church. We gather each week because we are among the people who believe that a life connected to God and a life connected to one another is the most meaningful life there is. For those of you who join us here in the beauty of this sacred space and others who join us online, we're grateful that you're here. We pray that as we share these moments of worship together that you will feel not only the love of this faith family, but we pray that you will feel near to the presence of God. So welcome. A few personal um, welcomes today. We have the confirmation class from Trenum Road, United Methodist Church in Columbia, visiting with us. They had a, um, a, a, a personal history tour, a little bit about Bethel and about Methodism in Charleston. And then I think that they may explore some beach tour or something later today. <laughs> But will you stand, folks from um, Trenum Road, please stand. Let us welcome you. We're, we're glad that you're here and we hope that you, you will take Bethel's love back with you to your pastor and your church family there. So, so glad you are here in worship with us today. The other personal welcome I want to do is to the Reverend Dr. Tony Hopkins. Some of you have met Tony and Carol. They've been worshiping with us since uh, early January, and I've discovered that Tony is really the Reverend Dr. Tony Hopkins, who has spent his uh, adulthood um, in the vocation of pastoral ministry, and is in the early days of his retirement, grandchildren have brought them to Charleston, and so he and Carol have made their home here in recent months. and. It would be a shame to have a gifted preacher sitting in the pew and get rusty. <laughs> so uh, I am thankful that he accepted my invitation. And as I told the first um, service today, I very much appreciate male and female voices. While we look, um, while we're grounded in this same faith, we see the world differently and different perspectives uh, add depth and breadth to faith. So I'm so grateful that, uh, that Dr. Hopkins is here with us today, uh, out of the pew and into the pulpit. And I know that when the service is over, you'll be glad that he stepped from pew to pulpit today as well. So Tony, we welcome you and are so thankful that you're here. I trust that you'll look on the back of the bulletin and see the many ways that Bethel offers us to grow our faith. Most notably, this Friday night, the Chancel Choir that sings at this service will be offering um, um, a gift of music Friday night. It's sort of part two of what we've done before back in January. Uh, they have um, real gifts to offer, and it will be a blessing to all of us who attend. So spread the word, and, and we'll be here together on Friday night. You'll see other ways to grow our faith through um, Habitat for Humanity or if you're a... Um, college, um, returning to college or graduating from high school opportunities for scholarship that Bethel wants to support you in your endeavors at school. So you'll see words about all of that on the back of the bulletin, and I'll trust that you will participate in all of those that uh, pertain to you and allow you to grow your faith. But for now, in the beauty of this sun-drenched space, I invite you to join with me as we breathe deeply of the gift that is our life as together we make that sometimes difficult but always necessary transition from getting here to being here as we use these moments to prepare our hearts to worship God.
different as we are, we come believing that there is a God who creates and is creating, Jesus who redeems and is redeeming, and the spirit that sustains and is sustaining us still. And so with words ancient and true, let us unite our voices using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 as we share our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. One of the wonderful traditions we have at Bethel as a family of faith is that whenever someone in our family finishes their time in history and begins their time in eternity since we were last together, we always stand in gratitude and honor for their life. Many of you have heard already or saw in the morning paper of the obituary of Jerry Britton. Her service will be here on Tuesday at 11. Received word this morning that Martin Ackerman, Bill Bates' brother, passed away yesterday, and funeral arrangements for him are not yet um, complete. But these two, Jerry and Martin, are people that we want to honor simply with our lives today. So as you are able, I invite you to stand as we remember these two, two before God.
Loving God, we thank you that these who we have called friend and colleague and neighbor and Redbird volunteer and food pantry colleague, that these whom we have shared life with, that before they were ours, they are yours. And we thank you for the witness of their faith. So we stand in recognition and in gratitude for the life of Jerry Britton and for the life of Martin Ackerman. Remind us all that you are the author of our journeys, you are our companion on the way, and you will be our destination's end. And may that truth reverberate in our hearts and ground us in these days. With gratitude, we offer these to you. Amen. You may be seated. So you'll see in our bulletin under the 9 o'clock service, we have names listed for those who are in places of uh, recovery or places of need of any kind. And I trust that you will take these bulletins home and remember these during the week. You'll notice the name Brad Solomon, which will probably be a familiar name if you are um, watching the news these days. All downtown churches received an email yesterday asking that as we gathered as a Charleston people of faith that Brad, who is um, among the residents of Charleston who has dementia and um, is now um, missing as he deported the, uh, the cruise ship in Cozumel, the family asked that the Charleston community of faith remember Brad before God as we gather this morning, and I assured them that we would. There are other things that your hearts hold today, and we believe that there is one who hears and knows and cares. And in that confidence, we begin to pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, we pause in these moments to bring before you the contents of our hearts. You have knit us in a web of friendship and family and community where there are church connections and work connections and faith connections. We belong to one another, in other words. And so when one is hurting, the rest of the body hurts. And so we stand in solidarity with one another for all the things our hearts hold today. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families and friends and neighbors, and for those who are alone, we pray to you. For this community, the nation, and the whole wide, wounded, warring world, for all who work for justice and freedom and peace, we pray to you. For the just and proper use of your creation, for victims of hunger or fear or injustice or oppression, for those who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for all who minister today to the sick and friendless and needy. For the peace and the unity of the church of God and for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, we pray to you. Especially here in our one point on the planet, uh, corner of Pitt and Calhoun, we pray for those who are in a process of confirmation, of learning and discovering and growing, that your spirit might accompany them as they approach their own 
I will to this lifelong journey of faith. And for today's preacher, that you would fill his mouth with your word and fill our hearts with your presence, we pray to you. Believing then that you are a God of love and of mercy, we are confident to entrust these and all our many prayers to your good care as we pray the prayer our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I meant to mention that Bill, the Reverend Bill Felder, celebrating a birthday today, 84 years young, and we give thanks for your life. As an expression of our gratitude to God and so that the blessings that come to us might leave this place to bless others, it's our opportunity now to express that gratitude through our tithes and morning offerings. One correction as we prepare to sing our second hymn, it is hymn number 539, O Spirit of the Living God. So if you will join me as we raise our voices together, hymn number 539.
This morning's first reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, For an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I am grateful. I am grateful to longtime friends, English and Cindy Piercy, members here at Bethel, for first inviting my wife and me to Bethel a few months ago. I'm grateful to the church family and especially the covenant class for making Carol and me feel so warmly welcome. I'm grateful to Susan Leonard for inviting me into her pulpit today. I'm especially thankful to preach during the Easter season. I grew up in a tradition in which Easter was a single day Easter Sunday. How wonderful as an adult to discover the liturgical calendar in which Easter is not a day but a season. 50 days from Resurrection Sunday to Pentecost Sunday. For Easter to be a season means that we have the opportunity not only to proclaim that Christ is risen but also to think about what that means for how we live every day. If Christ is alive in believers and in the church, what does that mean for how we live and serve and witness? Woman's business was growing rapidly, so she decided to move into a new, larger facility On her first day in the new facility, her husband sent her a congratulatory flower arrangement. When she got home that evening, she said, thank you so much. That was so thoughtful. The flowers were beautiful. I did have one observation, though. The ribbon on the flowers said, rest in peace. The husband called the florist who apologized profusely and then the florist said, well, if it makes you feel any better, there's an arrangement somewhere in the cemetery that says, best of luck in your new location. (laughs) That would be a surprise, wouldn't it? To come across that in the cemetery In our lesson from the Gospels, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene encounter an even greater surprise in a cemetery. Matthew tells us that they came to the tomb very early in the morning. Mark adds that they brought with them spices so that they could anoint Jesus' body. And that on the way, they discussed whether they would be able to roll away the large stone which sealed the entrance to Jesus' tomb. But when they got to the tomb, Matthew says, 
an angel, a messenger from God, rolled the stone away, and the earth trembled, and the guards trembled. And the angel said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here because he has been raised. I mentioned a moment ago our thinking about how the Easter story affects us. Part of that is how the story affects our feelings, our emotions. I don't know of a more amazing story anywhere, but candidly, most of us are not feeling particularly amazed right now. That's not a criticism. It's just because we've heard the story so many times. Psychologists call it desensitization. Anything that we're exposed to over and over loses its wow factor. And many of us have heard the Easter story since we were young children. When I was pastoring in Greenwood, we had a chapel for our preschoolers on Wednesday mornings. And I remember a chapel during Lent when I said to the children, it makes me so sad to think about Jesus dying on the cross. And before I could get out another word, a little girl said, well, he rose up again on Easter. <laughs> At age four, she already knew the story and apparently thought that I did not. <laughs> I will grant you that children don't always get all of the details exactly right. I heard about a children's sermon in which the minister invited the children to tell the Easter story. A little boy said, on Easter morning, Jesus came out of his tomb. Then he saw his shadow and they had six more weeks of winter. <laughs> the point is, many of us have heard the stories of Easter since we were children, all of our lives. So we come to worship during the Easter season and hear these stories. We're not surprised. But I assure you, the women in our gospel lesson were very surprised. They are coming to the tomb in order to anoint Jesus' dead body. And they are very surprised to find that they don't need their spices. And they don't need to worry about rolling away the stone. And by the way, notice that the angel doesn't roll away the stone to let Jesus out. He's already gone. The angel rolls away the stone to let the women in. Because the angel knows that the women will be so surprised and so amazed that they will need to see for themselves that Jesus' body is gone. I was thinking last week about trying to help us recapture or at least understand the surprise of Easter. And I thought about Jacob from the Old Testament. Joseph. Jacob's beloved son is sold into slavery by his brothers who dip Joseph's coat in goat's blood and tell their father that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. The old man is devastated. He is inconsolable. His other children try to comfort him but he says, there is no comfort for me. I will grieve my son until the day you put me in my grave. And week after week, month after month, year after year, Jacob grieves. And then, one day, out of the blue, 
Jacob finds out that Joseph is still alive. Can you imagine how he felt? What a wonderful and amazing surprise. I think it's safe to say Jacob was never the same after that. I think we can say the same thing about the women in the gospel lesson. They were never the same. The disciples were never the same. For that matter, the world was never the same. And I think that our lesson from the epistles explains why. Paul says not only is Christ alive, but he is alive in you. Because of Christ, Paul says, God is alive in you. The same one who gave life to Jesus on Easter morning gives life to you through the Holy Spirit who is alive in you. And too many people have experienced this life from God, this living Christ in us, this Holy Spirit alive in believers and in the church. Too many people have had this experience for it ever to be suppressed. Oh, people have tried to suppress it. The communists in 20th century Russia tried to say God is not alive, Christ is not alive, the Holy Spirit is not alive. They should have known, the communists, that they were going to have an uphill battle. In the Russian Orthodox Church, every time those believers gather for worship, they use a liturgy in which the priest says, Christ is risen. And with one voice, all of the people say, Christ is risen indeed. But the communists thought that they could erase people's experience of the living Christ and they could erase the church. Gordon MacDonald tells the true story of how Stalin closed all of the churches in Russia and persecuted believers who worshipped secretly. And in time, he announced that communism had replaced Christianity in Russia. He was so confident of this that he gathered people from all across the nation to hear a speaker who was to demonstrate by careful argument that the teachings of Jesus had been replaced by the teachings of Marx and Stalin. For three hours the speaker thundered away at the gospel trying to dismantle it brick by brick. At the end, he was exhausted, but he believed that he had pronounced the final epitaph of Christianity in Russia. And just before he dismissed the large crowd, an old priest stood in the back of the hall and said, I have just one thing to say. Christ is risen. And with one voice, all of the people said, Christ is is risen indeed. You cannot keep the gospel quiet and you cannot suppress the church's experience of the living Christ. Gordon MacDonald said he was on a preaching tour in America and he told that story in a church here. And after the service, an elderly couple came up to him. The woman said, I'm from Russia, and I want to thank you for telling that story. But the next time you tell it, you need to be sure and say that all of those people who said Christ is risen indeed knew for certain that they would go to jail. You cannot keep the gospel quiet. And you cannot suppress the church's experience of the living Christ. For the 20 wonderful years that we pastored in Greenwood, every Easter Sunday, 
As our children came into church, we gave each child a bell. We called them Alleluia bells. We always began that service by singing the great Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. And every time the congregation sang the word Alleluia, the children would ring their bells. The first person I heard talk about this particular worship tradition was Dr. Dan Elshire, a Christian education professor at seminary when I was there. Dan said when they introduced the Alleluia bells in his church, it took the children about a stanza to catch on. But for the rest of the hymn, there was this wonderful, vigorous ringing. And then for the rest of the service, Every few minutes, you would hear a bell somewhere out in the congregation. You can't keep the gospel quiet. You cannot keep quiet the alleluias of the Easter season. Dan said one Easter Sunday, his family came home from church, and as families will do, they dumped all of the paraphernalia of church onto a table in the den. Bibles, Sunday school books, orders of worship, children's bulletins, and a bell. Dan's children played outside that afternoon, but when they came back into the den that evening, Dan's little boy walked over to the table, picked up his bell, turned to his older sister and said, sing the Alleluia song so I can ring the bell. This is the mission of the church. To go into the world and sing the Alleluias of Easter and the gospel will start ringing. pray with me. God who is alive in the world, Christ who is alive in the church, Holy Spirit who is alive in us, in this Easter season we ask you to give us new life. Raise us to walk in newness of life so that we might live like Jesus, which is to say, so that we might love like Jesus. We make our prayer in the name of our living Lord. Amen. For as long as I can remember, In every worship service, when I have been the preacher, at this point, I say to the congregation, God's word is always invitation to the people of God. Most immediately, you're invited to sing our hymn of commitment and, if the Spirit leads, to come to the altar to pray for a few moments. This week, if the Spirit leads, you're invited to call Susan Leonard and say, I think Bethel is the place that God wants me or my family to work and worship, and I want to talk about joining the church. Certainly this week, you are invited to let the living Christ show forth in your life so that those around you will hear the alleluias of the Easter season. Our hymn of commitment is number 438. In body or spirit, let us stand as we sing together.
now in the name of God, the Creator who has given us life, in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who has redeemed us by His great love, in the name of God's Holy Spirit, who is alive in you and in your church. Go from this place to be God's people and to do God's work. Amen.